Mask mandates are falling all over America. New York City has announced that the mask mandate for school children will be removed. And a number of cities are removing mask mandates indoors. Certainly, I hope outdoors. There's got to be just a few stragglers left that still have the audacity to mask anyone outdoors. And almost always, it'll be children, I think. Because no one has the guts to do that to adults. Because it's obviously a ludicrous thing to do, masking outdoors. I think that's something everyone agrees upon, even the most ardent proponents of masking. But these restrictions are all falling down all over the country. But there are a few places that still stubbornly resist, and that's what intrigues me, because what possesses them? I just saw Yale University announce today that they're going to stick with their indoor mask mandate, even though the county and the city, they're dropping theirs. What sense does that make? I really wonder. I mean, why does Yale want to be the last people on that island when everywhere around them there is no mask mandate, but they want to have it on the campus? And of course, their campus is probably the most heavily vaccinated and boosted place in that area. So that's arguably not the place that uh, even if you were to believe it has a huge benefit, that's not the place that you would want to do it. I also noticed another interesting thing. The Surgeon General Now, this is a political appointee. It's the president of the United States that appoints the Surgeon General. The Surgeon General has asked Big Tech to fork over the information of people who are promoting health misinformation. I want all that information so that they can decide what to do about it. Does anyone else find it troubling that a political appointee is the arbiter of what science and health is truth or fiction? I think even people who believe that there is a problem of bad information out there, and I'm one of those people who thinks that's a problem, Wouldn't you have pause if the person who polices that is, in fact, appointed by the President of the United States? And if you don't have pause, just close your eyes and imagine. Imagine now that it's the President that you didn't vote for. Now imagine if you're happy with that. I think that's the thing about policy and particularly political power that we forget. We should not imagine how a power can be used by someone that you support and voted for and like. You need to imagine how a power might be used by someone you don't like. And if you don't like how the power is used by someone you don't like, you might not want to give the office that power. I think it's deeply problematic that a political appointee would be the person who decides what scientific truth and fiction, especially as we know, when you are in an unprecedented moment, what is considered mainstream, what is within the Overton window, it's constantly shifting and it's always based on where the set point is for people rather than where the evidence is. Now, for instance, the mere idea of suggesting that we unmask children, even six months ago, was incredibly outside the Overton window. I know, because I wrote an article in The Atlantic making that argument, and it was met with fierce resistance. But fast forward four months later, and it's suddenly something that many, many people are on board and now there are dozens of op-eds making that case. Why is that? That's because to shift people's attitudes, it's more than the evidence. The evidence can be the same over a period of time, but people's attitudes shifts as their anxiety shifts, as they have time to use that cognitive portion of their faculty as uh, people become more comfortable saying things. I think a big thing that leads to shifts in attitudes is when somebody breaks the wall and is the first person to say, hey, did you know this doesn't have a lot of evidence to support it? And then other people say, you know what? I feel the same way. I've been reluctant to be the first to say that. But now that you say it, I have to say you're right. And that takes some time. It takes some momentum. I mean, that's often the case in science. And in my own career in science, I've seen that several times. Some of our work on genome-driven cancer therapies, when we were first doing it, was met with fierce resistance. And a few years later, the same people who resisted it were saying, well, I knew all along it was only going to have a modest impact on cancer patients' outcomes. Well, you didn't seem that way when we were first talking about it, but sure, I'm happy to have you save face and defeat. The same is true on these issues in COVID-19. So what do I think is going on here? I think that the society is right, I think, to move away from restrictions. I think we wish we had done better studies so we would have known when they work. And having not had those studies, when cases do eventually someday rise, as I suspect that they might, we have no good way to know what restrictions to put back when. But I do think we have a lot of problems if we enter into contradictions or hypocrisy. No matter how you feel about masks, I don't think anyone can defend the proposition that 80-year-old politicians in a crowded indoor auditorium listening to the State of the Union, they're the ones who don't need it, but very young school children who have the lowest risk of the virus, they're the ones that do need it. I think that's an indefensible position. No one can defend the proposition that 80-year-olds should be exempt and 10-year-olds should be the target of the policy. That's hard. I think it's another thing that's hard is a politician 
who's showing their face and is smiling in a photo, surrounded by little children who are masked, I think that has a bad optics to it. And I think a lot of people are living through that. So no matter how you feel about these restrictions, we have to be very careful that if they're ever to be reemployed, which I strongly urge not doing that or doing that only in a controlled study so that you can find out for once and for all the effect size, but if they are ever to be reinstituted, they cannot be done so in a way that is nakedly contradictory or nakedly hypocritical or exempts people with power and places them on people with no power. I think that would be problematic. And then the next theme, I think, is that you don't want somebody who's a political appointee deciding what is scientific truth and fiction. You never wanted that. And you certainly don't want that now. It's deeply problematic. You don't want politics to be able to control what speech is permissible. I think that is something that in this country people have long understood. And it's something that we should be very cautious of. And even if that means that some speech is said that you disagree with, don't like, or is not true, it's better it for it to be that way than to have the person who's controlling the speech be someone who is in fact a politician. That is a recipe for total disaster. And if you are not concerned that the Surgeon General is asking Big Tech for these records, imagine if it was the Surgeon General for the last person you dislike. Imagine, do you want that person to be able to control what is health, truth, or fiction? I don't think you do. And I don't think people fully appreciate that a lot of these things are much grayer than we think. Medicine has always had gray zones. Those gray zones get painted over, painted into black and white over time. But when something is new, not only is there a gray zone, it is a huge gray zone. It's the biggest gray zone there ever is. Most things in medicine that appear to be settled also have a gray zone. We just don't talk about it that much. But things that are not settled science, things, and by not settled, it's impossible to settle something within a year or two years. It takes decades to settle. And I think many of these things will settle very differently than the way we've talked about. I do believe that, that our view of lockdowns will be mostly negative over time. I do believe that that is going to be true because the harms will continue to accumulate and become visible and the benefits will appear in, re in retrospect to be very modest, if at all, and that lockdowns, as I have analogized before, are like bloodletting. It's not that bloodletting doesn't work under any circumstances. It actually does work according to a few, and one would be hemochromatosis. But bloodletting doesn't work for pneumonia or epiglottitis or whatever it is George Washington had. I think I once said pneumonia, and somebody said actually it was epiglottitis. Well, whatever it was, whatever George Washington had, bloodletting wasn't the cure for that, for sure. Let's agree on that. And lockdowns are similar. They may have worked under very narrow targeted conditions and maybe islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that can completely cut their borders, but they didn't work for most places. And I think they did a lot of harm and they were deployed in lots of bad situations, lots of erroneous ways. One, you deployed it when there was no propagation of the virus. And so by the time you wanted to deploy it again, the populace had fatigued, which is what happened, I think, in a lot of this country. Or you deployed it when the horse was out of the barn and explosive spread was guaranteed and that spread was going to have its own trajectory whether or not you dropped the intervention. I think that happened in some places as well. So it's going to be very difficult to tease that out. I think our view of masking may, I don't know exactly where that'll settle. I really don't know. And I think uh, I'm open to whatever Bangladesh 2 randomized trial does, whatever Bangladesh shows in their um, f uh, missing, missing endpoint, that secondary endpoint of random seroprevalence that's unreported. I'm open to that. But I do think when it comes to children and very young children, particularly that space where the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC, that two through five-year-old space where they went beyond the World Health Organization and recommended masking, and we did so with sort of a, a extreme vigor in this country, basically, you know, th even to the point where it was a prerequisite to attend a commercial flight. I think that part is going to look very, very bad in retrospect. It's going to look very, very poor, and that's not going to age well, and that's why I think it's going to be so catastrophic that the agencies that supported that are going to face real structural challenges. That's not going to age well. Um, I think the schools has already not aged well. I saw that coming a mile away. I was one of the most ardent proponents. You could go back and pull it. I don't think you'll find anyone more ardent about that issue than me. I knew that was a bad call. I knew that was a bad call. It took me a while to figure it out, but by while, I mean the fall of 2020. That's when I figured it out. I wasn't as smart as some people. I think David Zweig, I think the Swedes, they all figured it out in the spring. I think Jennifer Nuzzo from now Brown University, she figured it out in the spring of 2020. It took me till the fall. But uh, I, I'm happy to admit that it took me a while to figure it out, that it was a huge error. Um, but it certainly didn't take me until the fall of 2021, which is when it took the rest of you all. And some people, they were still calling for prophylactic shutdown, even with Omicron, which would have been disastrous. But it did lead those calls to massive disruption of school, not for... 
COVID per se, but because we had staffing issues or other sort of holidays, uh, there's been far too much school closure over the last few months than there ought to have been, and certainly not when you're playing catch up for having neglected children for a year and a half. That's something that's not going to age well. These are live issues. I think the lab leak debate is beyond my ability or interest to keep track of, but these are live issues. They cannot be settled with um, a political person deciding what's truth or fiction. I think boosters um, are are a great example. Uh, Primary vaccination, I think, is something that uh, many of us believe is an unmitigated good. But boosting, I think, is something that we believe is a tailored intervention. It works really, really well if you're really, really old and vulnerable. It works maybe very, very modestly well if you are very young and healthy. Why? Because your baseline risk is already so low after primary vaccination. So what more could you gain? And that's why Paul Offit, I think, has advised his own son in the Atlantic article that he told him not to do it because he thought the harms and benefits were really sort of very uncertain. That's something that the administration has decided to come out ahead of the FDA. In fact, so strong on that issue that we've had resignations from Gruber and Krauss within the FDA. And now you're saying that same administration that has jumped over regulatory authorities that are civil servants, jumped over that to make what they believe is a political calculation, in part a public health calculation, but also a political calculation, is the same entity that gets to police what information is deemed truth or fiction. It's deeply problematic. And Imagine, again, your political opponent has that power, and if you don't want them to have that power, then we certainly shouldn't have that power if we happen to be the ones who hold political power in the moment. We need to have some real checks and balances, and I think this is going to be critical going forward. So that's what I'm thinking about these days when it comes to COVID-19. It will be interesting to watch these mask restrictions come off and the order in which it comes off. Um, I think that tells you something not about efficacy, but about power. It tells you who are the people who are powerless in society. And I'm surprised to see that college students at elite universities, they are trapped into either a virtue signaling culture or a powerless culture, but they appear to have no recourse. They are subject to those whims. And I think that's because they know that a Yale degree means a lot. And if it means you have to wear a mask that potentially offers little value and that discomfort and that sort of social isolation that comes from that, they're willing to pay that price for that commodity of the Yale degree, maybe. But it also, I think, is something that they're signaling to their donor base and to the political class, the elites that happen to send their kids to that place, that they take this very seriously, so seriously that they're going beyond New Haven and they're going beyond that county in terms of what they're doing. But I don't think it makes a lot of sense medically. And I don't think that if you're a place that prides yourself on understanding information and uh, being very knowledgeable, I don't think that that is a wise move. I think you betray yourself as being maybe to some degree partisan, but certainly not a thoughtful um, connoisseur of information. And then the Surgeon General thing is really bad. So that's what you get on this channel. Uh, if you like it, like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. I think uh, I'm hoping for the day that we can talk about the hot news in biomedicine um, from drug development to uh, clinical trials to the latest studies in the news. So that's what I'm eager to get to. Um, but we still have this huge challenge on our on our horizon and that challenges both the virus and restrictions done in the name of the virus that don't make us that much better off so those are the two challenges i see and then of course there's the few restrictions or a few interventions that actually do make us better off and those are often under discussed or lost in the shuffle i hope to make it more clear to you so like subscribe comment me leave a message below until next time